we have shifted greatly from the child being first to the system being first. Hello and welcome to Restore Childhood. My name is Stephanie Edmonds and today I have with me Deborah Tisler, mom, child advocate, and currently running for school board in Fairfax County, Virginia. And we have a very important topic to talk about today because the Department of Education is trying to make an amendment to the special education law and there is a window of comment that the public can make. And so can you just really quickly get out that call to action up front and then we can go into why it's so important and what they are trying to do here. Yeah, so we need every parent and every person to contact the US Department of Education and they can do so by um, filing and writing a public comment on the website. So it's the federalregister.com. Um, gov. And there you can click on, there's a green button to submit your comment. And we need this to happen because right now, as we're speaking, the U.S. Department of Education is planning to strip parents of their parental consent for Medicaid services in the school system. Wow. Wow. Yes. So we need you to take this action right now because that comment period, I believe, closes at the end of the month. It does. So the sooner, the better. Exactly. The sooner, the better, because in my opinion, this special education law is one of the most important pieces of our public schools. Um, Actually, my son didn't get it in school, but he got early intervention from the birth to three program and Mm -hmm. because he had an injury when he was born. So I've been through the program and one of the foundational pieces, in addition to providing the services and the funding for them, is ensuring that parents know their rights. So can you just talk a little bit more generally about the IDEA legislation and your work that you do as an advocate? Yeah, absolutely. So the Individual uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the spirit of that legislation itself, which is attached to grant block funding to the states, which then feeds to your local school systems for students that are considered what is IDE, IDE eligible under what could be 13 to 14 categories. Some states also accept there is a 14th category for developmentally delayed, and that's for your younger children. But the spirit of this law is that parents are equal IEP team members. Now, an IEP is that individualized education plan. So if your child has a disability or you might think your child has a disability, then if they qualify, they would receive this plan that is built specifically for their unique needs so that they can access what's called a free and appropriate public education. And part of this in the spirit of the law is that the parents are truly equal members of that team. Now, if your child requires Medicaid services that need to be provided under IDEA's um, process, which includes the IEP, the parents are supposed to be part of that discussion with the team. And those services are attached to the child's goals. A goal might be, for example, um, Johnny will be able to decode or read consonant vowel, consonant words like cat with 90% accuracy by say March of 2024. And then the teachers will go ahead and measure that. And that Johnny might need support services from someone like a speech and language provider, that would be a Medicaid type service. Johnny might need someone from an audiologist because he might have some type of a processing difficulty with hearing or might have a a hearing deficiency. So there's all different medical providers under Medicaid that could provide services in school to support those academic and functional goals for Johnny or Susie or, or whomever has an IEP that's IDEA eligible. And that's where the parents come in and they're at the table and they say, okay, I will consent for you to bill my Medicaid services for my child to receive said services to support his IEP in the school-based setting. Now, if the parent doesn't provide consent, and in my humble opinion, just from my own line of work as a teacher, 
and as an advocate, parents generally won't give consent if they believe there is what I call an accountability gap, meaning they don't believe their child is going to receive those services in the way that they have provided consent to in the IEP itself. And they would like backup data as to when you're going to provide those Medicaid services. And the school systems haven't provided that piece of information so that the parent can provide informed consent, that these individuals are going to carry out specifically what I'm consenting to, and that they will actually receive those services, right? Because in IDEA, there's one piece that's missing. The parents don't get like insurance, we get an EOB, an explanation of benefits. And right now, if you have an IEP, even though the school systems are supposed to track the services like you would when you go to the doctor, you get an EOB. Um, we um, gave your child um, uh, their allergy shot at the doctor's office. You'll get some type of a statement that'll say allergy shot and a code and what was paid. There's no accountability as to what your child's receiving. And there hasn't been enough follow-up from the U.S. Department of Education with the local state agencies to the local state agencies, your school systems, to ensure that the parents are getting that information. So instead of addressing it and trying to close the gap, they're just trying to get rid of it altogether. Exactly. It's widening the gap between the parent's role and them being an equal IEP team member. And if, and if you've read IDEA, you know, um, I know, you know, I keep my little handy dandy book. This is IDEA in a book, right? You see all my tabs on it. Um, when you read through it, the, the parent is the essential member of the team, the parent and the guardian. When you remove the parent and the guardian, you're removing them from the table from the, the implementation part. So how they're going to carry that out. And when you go to the doctor's office for your, with your child, you have to give consent for the services. Parents must know who is providing the services and if it's going to truly support their child and what they've consented to in the IEP. So you have two pieces here with this amendment is actually going to conflict with the spirit of IDEA and what the regulations actually stand for, for the parent to be an equal IEP team member. Plus we know when the parent is involved and the parent is in the know and the school systems partner with the parents, the children do better. So why wouldn't we want the parents to partner and know what the providers are implementing and what their Medicaid dollars are going to be spent on, right? So, and you know, part of that is also training for the parents under IDEA. If the parents know how to implement something at home and they get trained on how to do that, that's even better for the child. Why wouldn't any organization or individual want that? And I think that we need to think this through because we have shifted greatly from the child being first to the system being first. Which is the opposite of what I feel like they're always claiming they're trying to do. Um, I've been doing some consulting on cases in special education. Parents don't consent to these services because they feel like the school says they're providing a service and the quality of the service is not there. Or they disagree about who the provider is. And instead of really trying to address these issues, it seems like they just play games, they bully parents. I've seen the emails, I've seen, I've heard the IEP meetings. And so why, I, I guess you're saying they're doing it for bureaucratic ease. Correct. How, I, I guess, how do they justify it? I, I, beyond that, like they're not out there saying that, right? How are they, how are they selling this to the public? Well, they're trying to say that this will allow, you know, basically a faster access and funding for these said services for children. The problem is that 
they need to go back and look at their own findings from November 30th of 2022, where they found multiple large school systems. One of them on November 30th, 2022 was Fairfax County Public Schools. We have almost 180,000 students. We have children um, with disabilities near almost 28,000 of the, that population is IDA or 504 eligible, identify with a disability. And they said themselves, I mean, Cardona said it himself in the letter to the school system that you have no mechanism during the COVID closure and surrounding time frame to have tracked your services that you're providing. So if, if we already know at the federal level that large school systems that have the resources and the funding, like my school system has about 3.5 billion in their bucket with a B, billion, right? Is failing to track the services that they are providing under IDEA and 504 and monitoring that. How do they expect then that under Medicaid, they'll do the same? We know that bureaucracy right now at the education sector is struggling with tracking those services. And I think instead of looking at amendments to strip parents of their rights and widening that accountability gap, we need to close it. Why don't we start providing EOB type information for IDEA services? So at the uh, every quarter here in Fairfax County Public Schools, kids are measured with their progress generally. And, you know, and again, it can change for an IEP quarterly. We need to add the service log to that, to the parents, because right now there are no service logs. My child graduated this past June. There's not one service log on any of his services and they've admitted they don't have service logs and they don't track it yet they're required to. And that's attached to their funding and secretary Cordona and the U S department of education is aware of that problem. So again, why widen the accountability gap? Right. Why don't we close it? So what else should parents know in terms of just knowing their rights, trying to, um, whether it's about this part of the amendment in general or or, or specifically or IDEA in general, how can they get informed? How can they stay informed? Uh, what What are other action steps besides going and leaving a comment on this particular amendment? First of all, broadly across the United States, every child that is ID eligible, um, their parent or guardian should receive something called a procedural safeguard. And that's the parental rights. And in that booklet, it's supposed to be written out in plain language, what your rights are as a parent to ensure, like I said before, that you are an equal IEP team member and that you are able to provide informed consent. So I would say that's your first big step. If your child does receive Medicaid services through your IEP, through the child's IEP, I suggest that you contact Medicaid and ask them, if you haven't received an EOB, which is an explanation of your benefits or any type of information, ask them for what has been billed under your child's name and please send that to you and keep that with your records so that when you go to your child's IEP meeting and they should never hold an IEP meeting without you, ask them for the progress notes that are attached to those billings so that you can provide informed consent and so that you can understand your child's rate of progress and your child's needs moving forward. I think that's like the biggest piece right there. And for those parents that have private insurance, the school systems under IDA can bill private private insurance as well, but they have to reimburse the parent for the copay. Many of the school systems are not taking that step with utilizing parent uh, provided private insurance which would save parents, a lot of our working parents that do have private insurance that are not Medicaid eligible to get those services in-house. And that really helps to coordinate those services for children with private insurance as well. So it's interesting that Secretary Cordona is not looking at that. It seems like they have a particular agenda that they're trying to get done 
that isn't in line necessarily with the one that advocates like you or even what I think the original intent of the people who crafted this legislation meant it to be. And so I, I really encourage parents to pay attention, to ask those hard questions, because if more and more parents do show up and start demanding this information and following through with their you know, demands and really keeping the pressure on, I think that we can make a difference and push back. It's just about raising that awareness and really, really knowing your rights. I talked to too many parents who have kids in special education and they've never actually read the law. And I know it's a lot. I know it's overwhelming, but you have to, have to, have to know your rights and just understand the system. It really does kind of lay out for you how everything is supposed to work. And as we can see, we cannot trust them to tell us how it's going to work. So we have to know. I really appreciate you, Deborah, for bringing us this information, for laying it out very clearly for the, the, the language that we're looking at and the specific action steps to take. Is there anything else that you want to tell us, again, either about this amendment specifically or anything else about special education and the work you're doing or anything parents should know? I think, you know, another really important piece is that parents should be aware that the school systems are supposed to provide instruction and in all the minimum of the five components of reading. And I encourage parents that if your child is struggling in the area of reading to ask, are you, you know, how, you know, how is my child progressing in, um, in phonemic awareness, in vocabulary and comprehension in fluency, ask these questions and ask for the data, ask to actually see the data points and then ask, well, how are you implementing the instruction? Now, some school systems for litig litigious reasons won't tell you if there's a program name attached to the reading um, instruction, but you have the right to know what you're consenting to and what you're consenting to is the specially designed instruction. And that is how they're teaching your child. So ask, you have the right to know, what is a specially designed instruction that you are putting into place and doing with my child? Because if you know, then you can help your child. Because if they're sitting there reading with you, you'll know what to do for them if you're better informed, right? So ask those basic questions. And um, if you're not given that information, go back into your procedural safeguards and point out that under IDEA, I am an equal IEP team member and that in order for me to provide informed consent, I need that information and I look forward to collaborating with you in the future for the benefit of my child. I need every parent to back that video up about 30 seconds and screen record that last little bit that Deborah just said, because I know a lot of times going into these meetings, it, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of jargon being used. And that is a script that I think can be very helpful for just staying calm and saying exactly what is in the law because this is a legal procedure so i love that little bit parents please 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 record that write it down take in the script to your iep meetings yes and again everything is about um, documentation so if the school system is failing to provide you that information or they're retaliating if you have these reasonable requests documented in that follow-up email with that specific information, for example, today at our IEP, thank you for meeting today for our IEP meeting for said child, include your child's name. Um, I did not receive said data or document about my child. Please provide it to me. And again, include that language. So be specific to what you're asking for and make sure it's written in an email and that you save that email, either print it out or keep a digital file on it. I always recommend that every parent, I, I know it's a lot, but either keep a digital file of all of your documents 
that you possibly can um, in order. I know it's a lot. Or if you're a paper person, create a binder and keep your documents in timeline order so that if you do need support or help, or even if you need to go into the IEP meeting or meet with the school um, employees and officials, you'll have everything in order and you'll be able to say on you know, May 20th of 2023, we met and I followed up with an email and I am still waiting from my child's performance on my state reading assessment. I still don't understand how my child received this score. So having that specific information will, one, send a few messages, one, to the school system that you are prepared and that you want to cooperate and collaborate, right? And it looks good to your favor and for your child. The other is if, unfortunately, if they don't respond in a positive way and you do need to file a, a state complaint or um, a civil rights complaint to the Office of Civil Rights, you have everything all together that you need in timeline order because those officials at the state and federal level will ask you for documentation and you'll be able to pull it readily without being so stressed. It's very emotional to go back and have to go over to how when you have to go back and look at how your rights have been denied over and over again, it's almost like getting punched in the face again, over and over again, because you really take that because you're, you're really trying to do your best for your kid, right? So if you have that administrative piece organized, it's so much better. You could also go to your school board members and request a meeting, come walking in with that binder or come walking in with your laptop, open up your file and say, look, I met with them, your team here from my child, and they will not give me access to my child's records, right? I cannot provide informed consent. It's holding my child up, and I need to ensure that their rights are protected. A mom with a big binder, is, exactly. it, can, it can send quite a message to the school and to the people who are dealing with your case. I believe in people power. That's the only way we're going to make change, and I firmly believe that we can handle this at the local level. Our school board should be handling the issues for our children. We shouldn't have to wait years for state complaints to go through the bureaucratic cycle or the Office of Civil Rights to go through the bureaucratic cycle. We should be able to ensure what our kids need needs are you know met here, right here at the local level. That is very true. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and call parents to action. This is very important. Right now, you need to go. What's the website where they need to go again? Federalregister.gov. So you're going to go to that website there. And I can send you, Stephanie, the link as well. So if you want to put it up. Um, yeah, we'll put that in the description down below. Make it nice and easy for you. Go leave a comment. Use this great information that Deborah just provided us with. And then keep going out there and advocating for your children. Please visit my website. It's deborahforschoolboard.com. If you need to contact me, there is a direct link where you can email me or you can call me. And if you need a resource or you'd like for me to go over that language a little bit more, send me an email or give me a call and I'll ensure that those resources can get to you. We have to take care of things at the local level. Thank you so much, Deborah, And thank you guys all out there. Remember to hit that like button. If you're new, subscribe to the channel. And for more, head over to restorechildhood.com and support our work there.